mode, don't worry. Um, I, um, I, I wanted to talk, I guess, a, a little bit about, obviously, what Louise has covered with the, um, the, the historical aspects of women's austerity, but also, I guess, focus more on, on the current feminist movement. I mean, obviously focused on where it's been uh, a, a hugely wonderful thing, but also focused on, on where there is a lack and where, actually, anti-austerity campaigners need to step in and, and kind of fill that gap. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I think, as, as Louise outlined, the relationship between women and austerity and women in the lowest paid um, and, and lowest valued work in our society is, is hardly a new thing. Um, and I don't normally quote Jermaine Greer because I, I don't actually agree with her on that much, but there was one quote that she said which I just think absolutely encapsulates it. That she said, women's work is shit work and any work that's done by women in any great numbers inevitably becomes shit work. Um, and that, that's been true when most production was in the home and production centred around there. Uh, you know, women will take on the most back-breaking tasks, uh, as well as, obviously, as ever, doing everything around the home and, and taking the majority of the responsibility for childcare. Um, like you say, it was true in, the, in industrialisation. Um, you know, match girls had some of the worst working conditions and had some of the worst um, industrial diseases as well. Um, and obviously, you know, maybe in, in the Second World War, there was a really brief reprieve where women were allowed to do men's jobs for a short space of time, but actually, the pattern in the labour market after that was that men were back into those factory jobs and women uh, were, were kind of sidelined into uh, domestic work which was lower paid and, and of lower value. Um, and obviously it, it doesn't quite look like that now. We do know that women work in all sorts of sectors of society um, but they are still grossly underrepresented in jobs that, that pay above the average um, and, and in skilled jobs as well. Um, I won't go through all of these statistics because I think otherwise you might come up with some of the same ones. Um, but actually men, um, the Office of National Statistics at the end of 2013 said that men make up the majority of the top 10% of earners and female graduates uh, across the board in, in most subjects are in lower skilled jobs than their male counterparts are. Um, the TUC has reported that 21% of young women um, are in low paid jobs in things like social care, waitressing uh, and cleaning and that the average wage for those jobs per year is £14,000. Now anyone that rents a house in London, um, we'll know that rent is, you know, even somewhere I live in, in Manor House, an average rent there is, is about £6,000 a year, so that leaves you absolutely nothing, um, and that's before anything like uh, tube fare or even eating, um, you're getting yourself to these jobs that you don't want to be at anyway in the first place. <laughs> um, and obviously you said it's one in five women that are, that are in this kind of work, but it is only um, one in ten men. In British society um, and of course as you mentioned the cuts to public services come on top of that so you know there's a huge burden that women are facing but I think the most shocking statistic for me um, that I found in looking around at this was actually um, the, a, a single um, sorry a, a couple's wage so if you take um, any couple um, right now their wage combined is actually the same as a man's wage was 40 years ago so, you know, you're looking at a situation where, you, obviously, it's completely hideous when, uh, you know, men were supposed to go out and earn a wage and women had absolutely no way to escape domestic violence. But it's really difficult to see how the situation has actually changed at all now because if you have a couple like that, it's impossible for the woman to leave the budget cuts. Um, I mean, she's not entitled to, to be assessed for things like housing benefit often on her own right. Um, the shelters, um, domestic violence shelters are closing. Boris Johnson's shut down almost every rape crisis centre um, in London. So, it, you know, it feels like we've almost come full circle where they say, oh, well, of course you women are allowed to get paid the same as men and, and you can have exactly the same rights as men. It's just that men won't have any either. Don't worry, you'll be equally <laughs> oppressed and it'll be equally horrible for both of you. Um, so, I mean, it, it is a, a pretty horrendous backdrop, I think, for women um, in this society in the middle um, of, of austerity. And um, I think exactly like you say, we it feels weird, it feels like there's a huge disconnect because there is this backdrop, and this is what it's like for most women um, in the country, by far. Um, and, and we've got this, this resurgence of the feminist movement that, that The Guardian are absolutely falling over themselves um, to report. But, but what they're reporting isn't matching the lives of, of most women. And, you know, that's not to sneer from the sidelines at all, because I think the resurgence of feminism it is incredible. It's incredible that you can um, go to, to rallies like the UK Feminista workshops and that young women will, will talk about things that, that five or ten years ago you just couldn't have imagined. I mean, you know, that, that people would sit around and everybody would be able to 
you're talking about the vegetable test and that actually everyone knows what it was and it's a mainstream <laughs> idea now. Um, it, it, that, that is absolutely amazing. But, I mean, just to take a few high-profile campaigns of the last year, obviously, I assume most people have seen the £10 banknote campaign uh, to get women on £10 banknote. Okay, fine. Um, no more page three, which I might be a bit more controversial, but I do want to look at as well. Um, and, of course, the various kind of women in boardroom campaigns to make sure that there's um, equal representation in FTSE 100 companies. Like anyone cares about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <there's>, uh, <laughs> apart, from the, um, apart from the boardroom campaign, I don't think these campaigns are, are by default bad. Um, the representation of women in public life obviously is important. Um, but things to me like Lone More Page 3, you know, we're not, that campaign to me doesn't speak about the economic reasons A, why women would pursue uh, that kind of career in the first place. They just talk about objectification as this kind of abstract, uh, this abstract idea. Now, I mean, of course, the sexualization and commodification of women is an absolutely awful thing, but, but actually for me, this goes much further than actually just feeling uncomfortable because someone's got their breasts out and you're trying to eat breakfast, you know? <laughs> this is, it is, it's about being able to delve into to the, the reasons that women are, are in that situation, the reasons why men are, are you know, taught to uh, think that, that, that this kind of thing is okay. Um, as well, I mean, take the women in boardrooms campaign, obviously, I think that's the easiest one to, uh, to have a go at. But, um, but this, is, this is a way of basically looking at the, the small middle class of, uh, of women who have the chance to move into the upper class and, you know, talking about ha them having equal representation in boardrooms, okay, an equal chance to oppress everybody else. Um, <laughs> and actually not looking at, at the vast majority of, of women who will never be in that situation, people who have to go around and clean the boardroom late at night before they're done, or, or, or get on a bus at 4.30 in the morning to travel into the city to set it up before their important breakfast meeting, or you know, the women that, that bring in their coffees, the women that look after their children uh, when, when they're at this, um, at this job. That is what we should be focusing on, because that's what affects most people uh, today. And the £10 banknote campaign, of course, I mean, in a way, it's, it, it's very um, illustrative of the, the problem that women face kind of daring to speak out in public life because we know the woman who, um, who launched it was, was sexually harassed in a completely horrendous way on, uh, on Twitter. I think that, that in itself was, was instructive of uh, the long way that we have to go in this battle. But, but even this campaign, you know, I was looking at it, I was saying, I, of course, you know, you can see precisely why people would campaign around this. You know, it, it, is, it would be horrendous to have um, something like that without any representation of women on it at all, um, other than the Queen. You know. um, <laughs> but, but you look at it and you think, really, you know, why are the mainstream media outlets so concerned with who goes on the £10 note? When, to be honest, most of the people uh, struggling to make ends meet, they don't have two £10 notes to rub together. Yeah. And if they did, you know, that would be wonderful for them. And, I, I mean, like I say, this isn't something where, like, we should sit here and, and, and sneer at what people are doing and say, well, you know, yeah, it's great that you're doing this, but it's not really good enough, and like, why aren't you talking about austerity? But, but actually, I think it is, it is massively important, because, you know, if these campaigns, um, of course they wake people up to, to feminism, and, and a lot of the people getting involved might be young women who have never uh, made those connections before, have never thought about sexism before. And now, once they go away from those campaigns, they're clearly not gonna just take sexism um, in their everyday lives, and, and that's fantastic. But actually, if the anti-austerity movement doesn't have a coherent response, then these women might go out and they might win a campaign, you know, page three might get shut down, obviously the, um, Jane Austen's going to be on a bank note, and then these young women will realise that actually nothing about their lives has changed, you know, having Jane Austen on a bank note does not mean that they're going to be more likely to be able to uh, break out of the cycle of low paid and oppressive work, it doesn't suddenly mean that, you know, they're going to go home and, uh, and find that they don't take the, the majority of the responsibility for, uh, for, for the home, um, Homework, what's it called? Housework. Housework, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. You can tell how much I do of it. <laughs> hey, hey, sister. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> but, um, but I do think this is fantastic important because if we don't take this seriously and we don't say that um, actually bringing women into the anti anti-austerity movement and talking seriously about women's economic oppression, then all we have is a generation of young disillusioned activists um, who understand that something's wrong and, and want to change it, but have no coherent narrative to string that together. Um, and that's why I think that, that really people 
we are concerned, and you recognise this massive injustice um, that women face in society, should look to the anti austerity movement. It's the one thing that can bring all of these different issues together. I mean, like I say, we campaign about domestic violence. Now, the biggest problem in a lot of domestic violence cases is that you can't escape if you don't have a stable home, a stable financial situation, all of these sorts of things. And, um, you know, why is, why is page three the only acceptable type of, uh, of pornography that you're allowed to show in the mainstream? It's because of uh, the huge um, media institutions that, that, that propagate it like that and tell us what the acceptable type of sexuality you're allowed to consume is. So all of this, I think there is a coherent thread of, of anti-austerity work running through it. Um, and actually, I think, obviously, I mean, people have heard uh, a lot today about the work that the People's Assembly has been doing. We held a, an anti, uh, a Women's Assembly Against Austerity uh, a few months ago. And, and that was amazing because we had all these people in one room who were talking about actually what, what life felt like and um, trapped, as it were, on the sticky floor, not what it felt like to just be brushing the glass ceiling, as, as most of us aren't, you know. Um, and, and it was incredible because actually now more women are in trade unions than men. The majority of people who join unions now are women. They're more likely to do it. And, um, and, and, and they are uh, being organised. Um, so obviously I think this is fantastically important. I mean, people have mentioned, of course, the, um, the demonstration that the People's Assembly is holding um, on the 21st of June. And I promise this isn't just the extended reason to, to plug this demonstration. I genuinely <laughs> do think that um, that actually for get, getting this right, you know, it needs bolstering a campaign uh, that, that can actually take on austerity, as, as people have talked about um, all throughout the day. And it means that we're not only in a situation where women can just say, oh, well, we can claw back all the gains that we've lost, actually. You know, getting a fully functioning anti-austerity austeri anti -austerity movement, um, it, it means that we can start to, to demand uh, alternatives and we can put forward the kind of demands that mean we're not just uh, constantly running to, to, to catch our tail. You know, we're actually saying, no, we want the type of um, economics and we want the type of um, economy that, that allow us to have the full freedom and to actually tackle these, these issues that we talk about um, properly. And, and that necessitates women's full involvement um, in the anti-austerity movement. It really does. And that's not just because, obviously, political and progressive movements should involve women. It's because it is the single best way that we're going to fight against the, um, the losses that, that we've had over the last few decades. And it's also the only way that we're going to be able to create a society uh, that works better for everybody. So I completely urge everyone here to, to obviously um, get involved in that and, and to make sure that the People's Assembly is fully representative of women, that the anti-austerity movement completely addresses women's concerns. And hopefully together we can uh, work to start changing uh, society around us.